Welcome to Act Two, You're On. Join us weekly at our studio roundtable as Rhonda, Kate, and Linda invite spectacular guests to weigh in on staying sexy, vibrant, and healthy. Launch your next great act with authenticity and purpose. Summon your courage, superstar, and step into the limelight. So grab a coffee or a martini and let's set the stage for a grand entrance. It's Act Two. You're on. Welcome to part two of our conversation with Tone Tyne, finding the next yes. Let's tee it up with Tone. So I ended up staying at Disney for 12 years and I loved it. Uh, And the only reason why I ended up leaving it was because, number one, I knew that I was never going to be able to get over to the creative side of things because by that point I was managing the entire animation department and Glenn Keane was like, Tone, what should I do next? Like he was, he was talking to me, like I was his boss. I wasn't, but you know what I mean? Like I was, I was in charge of making sure that he got his stuff done. Uh, which again, those those nerds that I went to uh, school with would have lost their mind if they knew that that was what <laughs> my job was. So anyway, my wife and I had our first baby in the year 2000. I, I said to her, her name is Kendra, by the way, in case I ever uh, refer to her again. So I say to Kendra, I, I say, you know, I always said that I wanted to get into kids TV, like Sesame Street, when I grew up. And if we're having kids, maybe we're growing up. Maybe it might be time to think about doing this thing uh, especially now that we're in LA and who wants to raise kids in LA? Uh, probably some of your listeners do. So, uh, forgive me for that. I, we didn't want to, <laughs> we, we, uh, you know, we had heard that it's, you know, the school systems weren't that great, at least at the time that we were there. And we were nervous about that. And, uh, I'm from the East coast and it sounded good to me to maybe go back to the East coast and, and to work for Sesame street sounded like a dream. So while I was still at Disney, I did a little bit of networking. I found out, uh, I, I asked around and I said, who's the person that hires people to do these little animated segments on Sesame Street, like the letter N or the letter I? Remember those? Mm-hmm. So I got the name of somebody and I went out to New York and I met with her and I had this amazing two hour meeting with her. And I walked out of her office with a commission to do the letter N and the letter I. And I, uh, I would work at Disney during the day. And then at night I would uh, go home and have dinner. And then I would go back to the studio and I would sit at one of the animators' desks and I would animate these segments for Sesame Street. And I was really, really proud of them. And Sesame Street loved them and they came out great. They they reminded me very much of the stuff that we had seen growing up, you know, very minimal color and very simple animation. Um, and I was sort of paying homage to uh, this uh, animation that I remember growing up on. Um, and it was really fun to do that. And uh, Sesame loved them, and they said that they would be interested in maybe giving me some more to do. And so that was really pretty much all I needed to have the confidence to say, "Wow, I could actually do this." You know, I could leave Disney and I could go and I could I could animate for Sesame Street. Can you even imagine that? That's amazing. That's a dream come true. So um, I knew though that a kid was coming and uh, or was there already, and I knew that it would probably be irresponsible for me to be a freelance animator in New York City. Um, So I felt like I needed to get a a job job. Luckily for me that I had spent 12 years in production at Disney, I felt like I could get a job in production and then I could freelance animate on the side. That would allow me the steady paycheck, but then also allow me the opportunity to do what I wanted to do. I knew that that thing that I was describing in terms of like the us and them, the creative and the production probably didn't exist in smaller places uh, around the world. So I was hopeful that I could be working in production and then I could also freelance. And um, I ended up getting a job in production at, at Sesame Street right away. There was a woman that wanted to hire me there and she had this amazing job for me where I was going to be the person that sort of, uh, there were outside companies that did shows like Dragon Tales and other shows like that for uh, Sesame Street. So the idea was that those companies would give me scripts and give me storyboards and I would look at them for content. I would make sure that the curriculum was in there and that the creative was in there. And then I would give notes. And then when I was happy with what um, they had delivered to me, then I would deliver them onto the workshop. So I was really the person in the middle. It was perfect because it was a great blend of creative and production. And so I quit my job at Disney. I said, goodbye, you guys. They were sad to see me go and I was sad to say goodbye to them, but uh, I was really excited about this new thing. So Kendra and I went out to the area. We did a little shopping around. We discovered this amazing two-bedroom apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey. And um, 
we told them that we wanted to live there. We got the movers, the movers came and they took all of our stuff and the stuff was on the road on its way to Hoboken when the phone rings and it's Sesame Workshop. And they say, we just had the biggest layoffs in company history and your job just went away. We're literally cutting out the middleman. So please don't come. And I said, well, my stuff is is on, on the road on its way there right now. And uh, they said, we're really sorry. Uh, if there's anything we can do to help, we will. And I hung up the phone and before I could even recover from that, the phone rings and I pick it up and it's the apartment building that we're moving into in Hoboken. And they say, you know, we um, forgot to get a paycheck stub from you or a con- employment contract or something. We need to get that before you can move in. And I said, well, um, it's funny you should mention that because uh, uh, my job just went away. So I don't really have that, but uh, I'd still like to live there. And they said, well, you can't, you, you can't live here. <laughs> so now I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get in touch with these people that are driving my stuff to this building that I'm not allowed to live in. So I, I without thinking much about it, I say to them, well, well, what happens if I pay my rent a year in advance? And they said, well, if you do that, then you can live here. And I said, okay, well, I'll do that then. Well, I didn't have that money. So, you know, <laughs> we... We clean out our bank account and borrowed some money from credit cards and things like that, loans and credit cards. And with zero dollars in the bank, I ended up paying our rent a year in advance and moving out to Hoboken, New Jersey with no job, a six month old baby, zero money in the bank and a wife with her eyebrows so cocked, it was like going off her head. So, and she's native California, by the way. So she was really not really interested in going to Hoboken, New Jersey for all of those reasons that I just listed. But anyway, we go there and now I need to try to figure something out. So I am going to every single place in New York that does children's television. I go to Blue's Clues, Jojo Circus, Bear in the Big Blue House, Little Bill. Um, You might've heard of some of these places. Um, asking if they can hire me. And similar to me walking around to those buildings at Disney, I'm going around to everybody and everybody is saying no, and that doesn't stop me. I go to the next one because I know there's a million to choose from. I make the list, you know, just like I made that list of, of animation companies. It's worked for me in the past. And I just go through the list and I cross them off when they say no. I went over to Noggin and uh, I met with the woman over there and she said, you've got a lot of really great animation experience, but you don't have any live action experience. So for those of you who don't know, there's animation, which is cartoons and then live action, which is real people, right? So she said, you need to get some live action experience. I said, how, 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 how could I do that? And then she said, well, we know this guy that has this little company. Uh, it's called Little Airplane Productions in New York. And all this guy does is um, live action stuff. He does short films for Sesame Street. He shows kids running around Central Park, acting like airplanes and stuff. Why don't you go talk to him and see if he can put you to work on one of his live action things? So I went over to him and I met with him. And uh, I showed him my animation. I showed him my two films for Sesame Street and some of the other stuff. And he told me, he said, your stuff is really charming, but I don't do animation here. Um, and I don't have any live action stuff to put you on. So I'll just kind of keep your name handy. So I had gotten toward the bottom of my list and I'm sitting on the train going back to Hoboken and I'm thinking, this guy is on the ground floor here. I mean, he's just got a new company here. This little airplane was pretty new. Noggin knows him. Sesame Workshop knows him. Nickelodeon knows him. All these people know him and they like the work that he does. It would be really smart for me to ally myself with this guy. It was just him and, and one other person in the office. And so uh, when I get home, I call him up and I say, I have an idea. Let me come back tomorrow and talk with you about it. So I went back the next day and I sat in his conference room and I said, okay, here's the idea. Let me borrow your company's name. He says, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, um, I'm just going to borrow it. I said, I'm going to go off and I'm going to do animation for Sesame Street. Like I I did the letter I and the letter N. Maybe I'll get the letter T or something like that. (laughs) And or number seven and uh, and I'll animate it. But instead of putting tone time on my animation, I'm going to put little airplane productions on it. That way, Sesame Street will go, oh, I didn't know little airplane had an animation division. So then all of a sudden, Sesame Street, who knows you and likes you, 
will go, well, we have this little animated project. Why don't we give this to Little Airplane and have those guys do it? I said, I'll animate it. We'll start getting so many jobs here that I'll have to start hiring other animators. And pretty soon I'll develop an animation studio at Little Airplane. So you do live action and I'll do animation. I'm not looking to be a partner or anything. I'm just saying I'll head up your animation division. So he thinks about it for two weeks and then he calls me up and he says, you know, the reality is that I never see this company ever getting into animation. I appreciate the way you sold yourself though. You're a great salesman. And I'm trying to sell these books to uh, these little bookstores and toy shops around uh, New York, That I, these little books that I've created. How would you like to come over and help me sell these books? And uh, while you're here, if I get some sort of a live action job, I'll put you on it. And so I said, uh, well, that's, you know, better than what I'm getting paid right now. So, uh, <laughs> and it's a little foot in the door of uh, working in children's television so in New York City. So I went to go work with him and I was really like death of a salesman. I hated it. I was walking around door to door, really trying to sell these little books. And uh, I was miserable. I was, ugh. The, the, it was really awful one day when I was trying to sell them at the Javits Center. There was this big conference happening and I'm standing at this little table trying to sell these books like this, you know, Girl Scout trying to sell cookies. I was just sitting there with these books and, and all of a sudden I hear tone, tone tied. And I look and it's this big producer at Disney that happens to be at this book fair because Disney had sent them out to like run this booth. He says, what are you doing here? I thought you left to go work for Sesame Street. And I said, oh, yeah, that job fell apart. And now I'm here and I'm selling these books. And, and I was so pathetic. And, uh, and then he goes back and tells everybody at Disney about oh. Tone is selling books. <laughs> and, and I start getting these condolence emails from people. And it was awful. <laughs> so so I... Uh, but, you know, and I, I, I feel like there's, there's a reason I'm there. I actually get put on a live action project and I'm the script coordinator for that. And I get some experience with that. And I kind of had that under my belt and I'm on my way to work one day and I'm going to the, to the world trade center, which is where my subway stop was. And that's September 11th. Mm. And we literally watched the towers mm. fall uh, from, a, from across the Hudson river. And that was the train, you know, I, it, just like a lot of other people, and this will be for a different mm. podcast, but the train I was supposed to be on was the one that got crushed underneath mm. the towers. I was running late that day. So like a lot of other people, I said, you know, do I really want to die selling books in New York City? Is that really what I'm, is that going to be my legacy? So I told the guy that I was going to be leaving uh, at the beginning of October. And he was upset that I was going to be leaving. And I said, you know, if you never do animation, it doesn't make sense for me to be here. That's what I came here to do. Um, and he said something to the effect of don't let the door hit you on the way out or something like that. So <laughs> I left. And once again, I'm unemployed and I'm in New York and I have a baby that's just a tiny bit older. And I have a wife whose eyebrow is even higher up on her <laughs> forehead now. Like, what are we doing here? But we had paid our rent a year in advance. So I was kind of in a sense trapped there. Like I couldn't even go back to California and get my job back from Disney because now we're living in this place. I'm borrowing money that we sort of had to make work. So um, so I ended up uh, landing a job at an ad agency called Curious Pictures. And um, I was producing animated uh, commercials and things like that. It was amazing uh, the amount of money that I was making there. It was relatively obscene, actually. But I was uh, I was working on a ton. I was doing a lot of work, uh, and I stayed there for two years. And uh, I got put on this Barbie account, and I was doing this Barbie commercial, and I was I was producing it. I wasn't doing anything creative. I was really I mean creative in the sense that I was overseeing it, but I wasn't creating anything myself. And I was doing this Barbie job and I started to get that feeling again, like, oh, I feel like I'm walking around door to door selling stuff. I felt like I was selling these Barbie dolls to people, you know, and I was I, I got that. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, why am I here? Is this really how I want to die Is selling Barbie dolls? So <laughs> I had a very morbid sense at that point. So uh, anyway, I. Uh, as I'm self-loathing, I uh, the phone rings and it's the guy from Little Airplane, and he says, "After you left, I um, I ended up coming up with this idea about this guinea pig that flies around in outer space, 
I, I, that's the kind of conversations you have, by the way, when you work in children's <laughs> television. I know this. Your accountants don't have those conversations. I, was, I just with had each that other. exact conversation with Rhonda <laughs> earlier today. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> So he says he had this idea for this uh, guinea pig and he was going to shoot it with live action. Didn't know how to do that. Got to talking to this director at Nickelodeon and she had suggested that he do it with the animation. And he told her what he told me, which is, I hate animation. I never see myself getting into animation. So she made a little test for him. She took a, a photograph of a guinea pig and she cut it up and she animated those little pieces of the photograph in this style of animation she created called photo puppetry. And she created this really unique look uh, and shared it with uh, this little airplane, shared it with Nickelodeon and they kind of flipped out about it. And they were like, this is really cool. And so they asked him to make a little pilot episode, this animated pilot episode with this guinea pig. And uh, he didn't know anything about animation. So the first person he thought of was me. And so uh, he asked me if I would come and I would produce this pilot episode for him. Well, I did. And uh and I had a lot of creative input on that. And I was really, really excited about it. And that show, it became a show eventually. And it, uh, Nickelodeon ended up picking it up for several series, uh, several seasons. And the show was called The Wonder Pets. And uh, for any of you that either uh, watch that or have kids that watch that, you might know it was a big smash mm -hmm. hit. And it was great. And I, I ended up quitting my job at the ad place at Curious Pictures. And I went over to Little Airplane and I produced this series for for Nickelodeon. And again, I started to get that feeling of real pride, you know, like I left Disney to go work in kids TV. And now I'm making a show for Nickelodeon for Nick Jr. Specifically, it was educational, it was animated, I loved the people. And better than anything was, I had to hire a bunch of animators and editors and writers and stuff. And I had to build this animation department at Little Airplane. So I ended up doing that thing that I had pitched to him two years before, where I ended up overseeing the animation department at his studio. And it was great. And what was interesting is that he started to sort of fall in love with animation once he got a chance to sort of work in it. And from that point on, all of his ideas were animated show ideas. And so all at once, I was producing Wonder Pets, and then I was producing another series for BBC, and I was producing one for Disney, and I was producing one for PBS, and I was suddenly producing four or five different shows or versions of shows uh, all at the same time. And then hiring on other producers to help me, I became the supervising producer overseeing a bunch of other producers. And best of all, as I was getting to know all the broadcasters, I was getting to know the tastemakers, decision makers in the industry, and they were getting to know me and they were getting fond of me, which was really important. So I was feeling great. And I ended up staying there for uh, about 11 years. Uh, at about the eight year mark, I started to get a little bit itchy I started to feel like I wanted to have a little bit more creative input. Again, I was feeling like the producer. I was that, I was feeling like I was on that track again, you know, like I was, I had to leap over and become creative again somehow. And I just didn't know how I was going to do that because everybody knew me, not only in the industry, at the studio that I was working at, everybody knew me as this great producer. I could do a budget, like, you know, like nobody could write mm -hmm. a budget. I could manage a schedule, but nobody, when I would, when I would write something, they were like, oh, you, you, you can write too? And I was like, what? That's the first thing I do. No, that, that, I don't want that. I don't want you to think of me creative second. And I started to get that feeling. And so I told the guy that I was going to be leaving the little airplane. And he uh, didn't want me to go because I had been there and I had been really doing a lot of good work there. And he had just gotten a call from the Mr. Rogers people at the time. And they said that they were interested in creating a new show uh, that was kind of like the essence of the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood Show. And so Josh, who's the guy at Little Airplane, uh, said to me, he said, I don't really know much about Mr. Rogers the way that you do. You're like the heir apparent to Mr. Rogers. Can you help me come up with this show idea? And if you do, we can share the creator credit. And so uh, I, I said, well, that's, that's the reason to stay. I mean, yes, now I'm suddenly going to be creative. So you know, just like everything in kids TV, they take a real, you come up with an idea for a show and it sometimes can take as long as eight years before that thing uh, actually sees the screen. So Napkin Man, I think, took six years. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I created a, a show with Josh called The Adventures of Napkin Man. It got picked up on CBC in Canada, which is like the PBS of Canada, and did very, very well. Won a bunch of awards and uh, did very well. And I was thrilled that I had that uh 
I had that ability to create something that was successful. So it gave, gave me that little shot in the arm. So as much as I was feeling like my outward appearance was just a producer, I knew that my sort of the inner creative was still alive and well, and that all I had to do was just expose it to uh, more creative opportunities. So after Napkin Man was done in 2014, I decided I was going to leave Little Airplane and I was going to go somewhere where I was going to be exclusively creative. I wanted to go somewhere new and start over again. And this time I didn't want them to think of me as a, as a producer. I wanted them to think of me first as a creative. And so I, uh, I was thinking about all the different places in the world that I would want to go do this. I mean, I could have gone to my garage and created stuff in my own, you know, little private garage, but how, what kind of credibility would I have had really going out there in the world? Like, yes, I know you knew me as a producer, but now I made something. Will you buy this? I felt like I needed, and this might be because I cut my teeth at Disney, which was a big corporate, you know, infrastructure. And then I went to Little Airplane, which also was kind of like a, a place that had a great reputation. I was always very interested in, in allying myself with somebody that already had a reputation that I could help bolster, you know? Um, and again, I'm sure that that had something to do with how I got started at Disney. Um, how can you go somewhere and make it make it great, make it better? And so there's this company that I had been in love with ever since it started, and I'd been following it called Fable Vision. And Fable Vision is a digital media company in Boston, and uh, it's owned by a, a guy by the name of Peter Reynolds, who's a children's book author and illustrator. They were doing digital media, and I I went out to um, meet with those guys. I had actually set up in meeting with them and I was very excited about meeting with them. I was so excited that actually I set the meeting and, uh, and I was going to drive to Boston to go have my meeting. And we had a polar vortex that night. And, uh, I knew that I didn't want to miss this meeting. I wanted to make sure that I had this meeting. So, uh, instead of taking my own car, I got a rental car and I bought the full insurance <laughs> on it. <laughs> And I drove that to Boston instead of my car. And it was so cold that the windshield kept freezing on me. I was, <laughs> I had this little cloth in the, uh, in the driver's side and I was, I was cutting this little, you know, rubbing this little hole in the windshield basically that I could look through, uh, in order to make it, it took me something like 15 hours to drive to Boston. So, um, because <laughs> I had to drive like zero miles an hour to get there, but I made it and I got here and I, and I met with Fable Vision and I said to them, uh, I'd, I'd really like to, to make kids TV for you. Um, sorry, I'm going to pause. I just want to make sure that you guys don't have any thoughts or questions or comments or want me to go in another direction before I jump in. This is the last chapter, by the way, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Go for it. <laughs> no. Okay. Good. Then let me rewind ever so slightly, um, before the polar vortex. So what had happened was when I was starting to toy with this idea of where do I want to go? Um, I got a call from Sony Pictures in LA and they told me that they had this fellow that they had met, some guy that had contacted Sony. He had a hundred million dollars to put toward this, um, this educational platform, this digital educational platform. And that he had gone to Sony with this idea and he wanted to license some Sony characters. And they told him that they don't license out their characters like that, but they were very interested in the project. And so Sony called me. And by the way, the way that they got my name was that they knew me, the guy who had called me, he had a wife that worked with me at Disney way back when. So it's great. You know, I'm a huge believer in networking and I know how, how beautifully that can work sometimes. So anyway, so he says, would you be interested in meeting this guy and seeing if you can develop characters for him and storylines and things like that? And then once you develop that with him, then maybe you can come to Sony and you can, um, to direct and produce it for us. And so I was like, wow, that sounds really interesting. And uh, I flew out to the Bay Area and I met with this guy um, secretly. And he told me that he had this $100 million to put toward this project and that he was interested in working with me. And he asked me to put a budget together for the first phase of this. And I gave him this budget that was very, very healthy, uh, that would allow me to hire some really great writers and some great uh, character designers, and also allow uh, a fair amount of money in there for me to oversee the project and also to do a lot of the creative heavy lifting on it. And so uh, he says to me in response to this big number that I gave him, he said, wow, thanks for going easy on me. That's very manageable. 
So I had this big, huge sum of money that was going to be earmarked for this project. That's when I started to think, well, oh, and he told me, he said, we're going to be in what's called stealth mode, which means for two years, you're not going to be able to tell anybody in the industry what you're working on. We have to be secretive about this. And I said to Kendra, I said, you know, I spent two years, I mean, I spent 12 years at Little Airplane trying to work my way to becoming a show creator. And now that I finally decided to leave Little Airplane, I can't tell anybody that I'm doing this for two years. I'm going to kind of disappear. I can't really do that. What I need to do is I need to be working on this big project with this guy at the same time that I'm creating original shows and pitching those. But that's when I had that thought about, well, I shouldn't go do that in my garage. I should probably go somewhere with an infrastructure and do that. So I went out through the polar vortex and I met with Fable Vision and I said, have you guys, you guys do books and games and apps and such amazing work with such heart that Fable Vision's uh, mission statement is they are moving the world to a better place through digital media, storytelling, whatever, fill in the blank. Uh, but their mission is to move the world to a better place. They're on a 200 year mission to do that, which I just adore that, right? That's what we're, that's what I want to do. So um, I said to them, I said, you do such amazing work. You've got such a great mission. Have you ever thought about kids TV? And they said, well, we think about that all the time. We just don't know how to do it. I said, well, I know how to do it. Why don't I come to Fable Vision and I can, I can run the children's television department for you. And they said, well, that sounds amazing, but we can't afford you. We don't, we don't have that. You know, we, we kind of live a little hand to mouth here at the studio. And I said, what if I told you I was going to bring my own salary? They said, mm, we're listening. I said, well, <laughs> I said, I've got this job that I'm going to be doing. That's got a hundred million dollars. And uh, rather than the guy pay me, I'm going to have him pay Fable Vision for the services of Tone. So he'll still be working with me. But what I'll do is I'll put that money into a pot, basically. And I will use that money to pay for all the different writers and directors and stuff like that, that we're going to use for this guy's project. And, but the money that I would take for myself, I'll just kind of leave it in this pot, basically. And I'll use that um, to you know, fund the development that I'll do at, at Fable Vision. And I'll start getting out there and I'll start pitching shows and all that stuff. And then in two years, when I'm done with this project, uh, then I can be you know, full-time working on my own original content. So they loved that idea because they uh, didn't really have to pay anything out of pocket and they were going to be getting me with my expertise. I said, I, I need to have a, a fancy title. I want to be called the vice president of creative. I made up that title. <laughs> I said, uh, I need a place to sit. I said, uh, I need insurance benefits for my family and I need a business card. And other than that, I don't need anything else. And so they gave me all that stuff. And a big press release came out that said, Tone Tyne is now vice president of creative at Fable Vision Studios, heading up all the children's television stuff. And the minute that that press release hit, my phone starts ringing and it's PBS and it's Disney and it's Amazon and it's Netflix. And they're like, Tone, because I knew all of those guys from my time at Little Airplane. Tone, you're doing children's television. I can't believe it. You're, you're doing your own stuff. That's great. So I said, um, yeah, I, I said, Man, I've got tons of ideas. And they said, well, just bring us your ideas, you know? So I was feeling really excited about that. The guy uh, with the $100 million wasn't going to be ready to get started for about a month. And so I said, well, that's great. I've got a month that I could be really investing in my own children's properties. And I was on fire. Stuff was pouring out of my head. Um, and uh, I was living in my friend's attic at the time. Kendra was back at the, at the, uh, at the house and she was trying to sell the house. And uh, the kids were finishing up school. So uh, should I say whose attic I was living in? You may. Okay. Do you want to say it? Was it was mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I know how this story goes and I'm still stressed out for Tom because <laughs> his relationship with risk and what it's going to take to be successful as an artist and live your vocation, it takes completely and fully committing. And now I'm going to bite my nails <laughs> while he tells the rest of the story. <laughs> so by the way, I have to tell you, Kate had an amazingly furnished attic. It wasn't like this old dusty cobweb thing that she stuck me up in. Um, and by the way, when I tell the story, I say I lived in my friend's attic and after two weeks, she discovered me up there. Um, <laughs> but I'm dumb. <laughs> but anyway, so, so I'm living in the attic. I'm working at Fable Vision. Ideas are pouring out of my fingertips. You know, I'm just typing up all this stuff. It's great. I, I'm on fire creatively. 
Um, I'm going out and I'm having meetings and I'm unfettered. I don't have to to work with this guy on the on the big project. I've got a month to to do all this uh, creative work. People are excited to see what I've got. I'm going out to Washington D.C. I'm meeting with PBS. There's a couple ideas they're interested in. They want me to go back and rethink them a little bit. So we're getting close to the end of the month, and I call up the guy in the Bay Area and I say, "Hey, you know, when are we going to get going here? You know, I haven't gotten the contract and all that stuff." He says, uh, the $100 million was given to me by this one investor, and the investor just dropped out. So there's no money. So now I'm living in an attic. My house is for sale. My wife has quit her job. And I've already told Fablevision that I can't, I don't need a salary. I can't go back to them now and say, actually, I do need a salary. And it's history repeating itself again. And now, now you have four and children. Not just the one. I got four kids yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And they're starving. <laughs> and your wife's eyebrows no, are no. now at the back of her head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're gone. They're completely gone. Um, and so I think, well, what do I do? Do I do I stay here and try to make a go of this? Or do I go back to New York and take the house off the market and try to get another job and you know stay where we are? And right as I'm sort of pacing the floors, I bump into this quote from Ray Bradbury that says, sometimes you have to jump out the window and grow wings on the way down. Mm, say that again. That's good. Yes. Say it again. Sometimes I, I didn't make this I up. Know. I, I'm borrowing it. Ray Bradbury says, sometimes you need to jump out the window and grow wings on the way down. Mm. And I think, well, maybe I need to jump out the window and grow wings on the way down. And so I've already started these relationships with these broadcasters. Now, for the first time ever, they're seeing me as a creative first. And let me just make a go of it. And I instantly, right when I kind of made that decision, I got a development deal with Sprout. And they paid me a really nice amount of money that I could put into my little pot at Fable Vision for the original property stuff. And then I got another development deal with Disney. And then I got this other little job that brought in a little bit more money. And so slowly I started to be able to put in some funds into my original properties account here that I could draw a little salary from whatever I needed, but then leave some in there for in case I, you know, needed to pay for an artist or work with a writer or something like that. And so that was in 2014, which um, was eight years ago. And since then I have stayed, uh, doing exactly that, uh, coming up with ideas for new shows and going out there and pitching them and getting people excited about them and ideally getting them to buy them from me. Um, I sold the show to Disney, which was very exciting. And I've, I have several projects in development. If uh, your podcast listeners could see me right now, they would see on the back of my wall back here, I've got a whole bunch of post-it notes that represent each of the different projects I'm currently working on. And there's something like 23 of them right now. So um, and I'm, I'm working on each of them in lots of different capacities. In some cases, I'm writing stuff. In some cases, I'm overseeing them from a creative, uh, creative executive standpoint. In some cases, I'm just conceiving the idea. Sometimes I'm working with other show creators on their idea and helping to cultivate that. So I'm doing a ton of stuff creatively right now. And, you know, it's interesting because all of those rejection stories, as Kate said, you know, I've got such a, a intimate relationship with failure. It has really set me up beautifully for pitching an idea to a network and having them go, oh, we have something that's too similar to that already. Or a network to say, oh, that doesn't really hit our demographic that we're looking for right now. Go back and try again. And you know, the beauty is, is that every day that ticks by, at least for me, the beauty is, is that um, there are more platforms coming up. There's Everybody wants their own version of Netflix. And so there's lots more places out there that I could be pitching my stuff to. So I spend about half my time working uh, on, on the project that I have in development and production. And the other half of the time is cultivating relationships with these people, going around and meeting people. I read a press release. Somebody has just been appointed in this new job. I got to get to know them. I have to meet them. I need them to know me so that I can then pitch to them one day. So I spend a lot of my time just forming relationships and getting to know people and just really getting them to say to me, wouldn't it be great if we could work together one day? Uh, and so that brings us to today. What do you think? And it's an amazing story of resilience. Yes. And <laughs> and just putting yourself out there and, and flopping a little and then 
coming up with the next great idea, the next great, great idea and living your vocation. And it is deeply influenced my, my life because watching you go through this process, it's well, first off, it's fascinating because it's a world I don't really know, but I do know the creative process and it's helped me. I think, uh, and, and actually I've worked with these two creative ladies. It's helped me in, in all sorts of different ways, but come up with another idea. And I'm not emotionally attached to that one because I'll come up with another great idea right after that one, if it doesn't work for us. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's very helpful uh, as your friend, but also for our listeners to know, get comfortable with failing and know that it's part of your process and release whatever it is that's, that is your thing. Step right into it and don't be afraid to fail because that's how you'll learn. Mistakes are our greatest teachers in some ways. Uh, and find buddies who inspire you. And I don't know, that's, that's the, that's the ball game. I think if things had worked out the way that I had sort of architected them, they probably wouldn't, I wouldn't have as successful of a career because I think that, you know, I got to where I am because I job crafted really. And then, you know, and and I, I tell that to people all the time that are starting out, you know, go to the place that you really, really want to work and figure out how you can help them, not how they can help you, but how can you what can you bring that's going to help them and pitch that to them? And, you know, maybe it might take them a little while to realize that that's what they need, but they'll get there. Mm, Absolutely. And I, I have to say, I just really admire your tenacity. Um, I mean, as a very young man, right. Um, With no experience. And sometimes youth is great that way. Cause you don't really know, like, if, as an indictment, go, well, I got to know here, I shouldn't go to the other mm-hmm. studios because that wouldn't, you know, you might like qualify it somehow, but when you're young, you're like, okay, they said no. And I told everybody, so I better run around and, and do that. And so it's really amazing that you did that and amazing, you know, that it started you on this journey. And you, you've clearly always been that kind of person, but, um, you know, you learned from that too and said, well, I'll just, you know, that's just the way you operate. Yeah. Incredible story. That's very inspiring. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Everything about your Thank story you. is inspiring. There's so much to take away. <laughs> yeah. I could listen to you all night. If we could take one thing, um, there, I, I love the run to the roar. Yes. That yeah. I, I know it came from it, but I love that it came from a teacher. I love that it stayed with you. There's just so much to take away from that particular antidote. What would you offer our listening audience? People are learning about their next great act or they're they're trying to make it work for themselves. What's the one thing you could share that golden nugget of wisdom? Well, something that I learned uh, at Disney uh, by observation, I saw this thing happen that was just incredible. And it has really, it's, it's something that I do tell to a lot of people that are sort of starting out. There was this uh, animator by the name of Tony Bancroft. He animated uh, Pumbaa in The Lion King and several other characters, but that's kind of his big one. And um, Tony really wanted to be a director at Disney. And he is a funny guy and uh, very outgoing. And every time there was an executive in the hallway, Tony would go, hey, uh, are you are you coming to me to tell me that you got a directing job for me? Or, hey, where's that directing job? You know, I got... I'm ready to do my directing job. I'm all set. And he would say that every chance he got to the people that were making decisions at the studio. And everybody would kind of giggle. Oh, that's Tony. He's, you know, one day the uh, director of Mulan uh, left the project and suddenly um, Disney needed to fill that director position. So who was the first person that they thought of? Tony Bancroft. Mm. And so he immediately got put into that position of being a director. And it, it's such a, a great lesson in, there's something that happens to people where they somehow are afraid to tell people what they want to be when they grow up or what they want to do. I think it's because they've got imposter syndrome or something like that. Like, I don't want them to look at me and say, you could never be a director. Why are you asking for that? But this guy, Tony had such great confidence when he said that, that I think that they were like, well, he's going to take that job seriously and he's going to do a great job. And, And by the way, he did, he did an amazing job on that film. And I just always think about that, you know, like how is anybody going to help you get to where you want to go unless you tell them where you want to go, right? If you're if you're on the street and you're trying to get your, yourself to a to a building where you have a meeting, you got to tell that person on the street you're lost and where you want to go for them to direct you there. You know, you're just not going to have somebody tell you that unless they know where you're going. So that's really what Tony taught me. And I, I, I look at that like a little golden nugget that I kind of keep with me. And I do that. I tell that to everybody. This is what I want to be when I grow up. Mm. 
Mm. That's a great one. So I am the timekeeper, uh, regrettably, and I could listen to you all night as well. Um, but tell <laughs> us um, what's next for you. Well, what's next for me is 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 more of what I'm doing right now. Uh, you know what I what I aspire to do is to create children's content that helps shape the citizens of tomorrow. I mean, what an amazing, uh, awesome responsibility it is to create children's programming for kids and help form them into good, kind people, right? That, and uh, that's a gift, I feel like. And uh, for me, I, I'm not going to stop unless I have tons of those out there, you know, like really furthering the mission of Fred Rogers and the people that created Sesame Street and all these shows that we talked about at the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. You know, my, what's next for me is getting all of those shows on the air and lots of different places where people can discover them, whether it's me creating them or me helping working with other creators that are creating them. But for me, it's really just moving the world to a better place, really fulfilling Fable Vision's mission to move the world to a better place through the work that we do. Mm, and the work at Fable it. Vision and the work you do at Fable Vision, it's all heart. There's so much heart to your art and it's deeply intelligent, like listening to the way you come up with the psychology of these little characters that, you know, it's for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. I do think you are living your life mission and it completely is Fable Vision's vision of what the future can bring. Mm -hmm. I love that it's a 200 year plan because yeah. maybe it's going to mm -hmm. be what it takes. That's how long it's going to take to write this ship, but you are doing your part, my friend. And, um, and so wonderful to be celebrating Valentine's with Joan. Oh, right. Yes. You're the X to my O my friend. And don't worry, <laughs> he's married to a former prima ballerina. So I love Kendra too, but uh, it's a very special friendship. And um, thank you for spending this time with us, sharing your story. I can't wait to see, as Pocahontas said, that's a movie you worked on, what's around the river's bend for you. Good things uh -huh. are coming. I can't, I can't wait to see it either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're crafting it, friend. You're making it happen. Yes. Mm. Yes. And, and you can, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, I right. was just going to make sure that everybody knows they can learn more about you at uh, fablevision.com and your projects and what you're working on. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thanks for having me and good luck to all of you listeners out there. Thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you so much, uh, Tone. And special thanks to our talented and skilled producer, Kathy Carswell. And so Tone and our listeners and viewers, it's left to me to say, go forth, be brave, live well, and do good, because it's Act Two, you're, you're on. on. Act Two, You're On was brought to you by Act Two, Share Our Stage. You can find us at a2yo.com and also on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please listen and subscribe wherever you find your podcast. You can support us using Patreon. Thanks for listening. 